Hello and welcome. My name is Brittany Nelson and I'm VP of Sales Operations and Corporate Training here at Innovate MR. We are an independently owned global sampling firm which specializes in consumer and B2B sample with a strong focus on advancing the industry and shedding light on a variety of important topics such as data quality and participant experience. I wanna thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Are we on a data diet? A review of consumer privacy legislation and how it's impacting our appetite for insights. First things first, today's webinar is scheduled to run about 45 minutes with some time at the end for questions. Feel free to type those into the interface at any time. All participants have been muted and a recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in the next few days. To get us started, I'd like to first introduce our presenters. Stuart Pardo is the founder and principal of Stuart L. Pardo and Associates based in Los Angeles. Stuart advises clients on intellectual property, data security privacy, employment and general corporate law, and various regulatory issues confronting the market research profession. Prior to starting his own law firm, Stuart served for nearly a decade as chief legal counsel for J.D. Power and Associates. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you so much for having me, Britt. Uh, next, Lisa Wilding Brown is Chief Research Officer for Innovate MR. As a 16 year veteran, Lisa is responsible for research on research, quality best practices, and sampling methodologies. She has presented at a wealth of industry conferences and contributed to trade publications such as Green Book, Wire, and the GRBN. Lisa has published research on engagement, survey design quality, and mobile best practices, to name a few. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Brittany, excited to be here. That brings us to today's discussion, where Stuart and Lisa will discuss the ever-changing consumer privacy landscape and its impact on the market research industry. They will update us on the latest trends in consumer privacy, as well as review the requirements for stateside regulatory readiness as it relates to the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA. So without further ado, take it away, Lisa and Stuart. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you, Stuart, for agreeing to collaborate on this. And, and just for a bit of background, um, you and I had presented this at the New England chapter for the Insights Association a few months back, and we got really great feedback from the audience there. And so we thought, what better way to help further socialize this very important topic by doing this webinar. So again, Thank you, thank you for for joining me. I'm excited. So let's um let's jump right in. I want to cover our agenda for this session. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the really very much evolving privacy landscape. There has been so much change that has hit our industry over the last year or two. So we're going to do a recap on where we've been and also where we're going. We're going to talk about the state of consumer trust. I think a lot of times we position ourselves as a specialized industry that really falls outside of ad tech, um, you know, SEO, social media, and we see ourselves very kind of differentiated from those other verticals or industries. And, and really the truth of the matter is, is that consumers are very often um, kind of grouping us all together and, and their state of trust with the market research industry is pretty concerning and I'll show some data that points to that. <clears throat> We're also gonna cover some key trends in privacy as well as some notable news. Again, I think if you look at some of the privacy breaches and issues around consumer trust, both here in the United States as well as in Europe, all of that is helping to lay the backdrop for how consumers perceive us and of course how government agencies and regulators are reacting to those concerns. We'll get into the nitty gritty around the CCPA and some of the other important regulations that have come out recently and what you need to do as a business to be prepared and respond accordingly. And we'll of course make some predictions for the future, what we can expect um, coming out from both the US and potentially internationally from other countries. And then we will wrap up with some, some Q&A. So feel free for folks in the audience to add questions in the interface, Brittany will be grouping those together and any questions that we may not get to during the session, we will surely follow up on um, after the webinar is completed. So the first question we have is, are we on a data diet? I think if you really look back through the industry over the last, call it 15 to 20 years, our appetite for data is insatiable and it's continuing to grow. 
Um, you know, I myself as a sample provider see more and more requests for personally identifiable information, whether it's needed for classification, segmentation, validation, whatever the driving force is for that um, that need, it is certainly increasing. And you know, the real the real issue here is that you know, we're not necessarily on a diet per se, but we need to do a lot more than we are today to clean up our act. And we can see this just in the way that we're engaging with each other as businesses. I've seen in certain instances where there'll be, you know, full address, first name, last name, data fields in a survey that makes it um, over to our side for sample and the client has failed to let us know that those fields exist in the survey until we catch it in our testing. So um, there is quite a bit of, of PII being collected and we need to make sure that we're buttoned up and that we're really mitigating the risk associated with storing and capturing and using that information. So if we think back to 2018, it was a really challenging year uh, for, for consumer privacy. Not only did we see a lot of consumer uh, privacy breaches from some big tech giants, and I'll talk a little bit about that momentarily, but as a business, we were really busy. And I know, Stuart, you and I have worked together for over 10 years across two different companies, and you and I spent a lot of time together uh, in May of 2018 dealing with last minute agreements that our clients and vendors were sending our way. Um, so it was a pretty hairy time. We got through it together. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful support. But if I do look into my crystal ball, I anticipate that November and December of this upcoming year are going to be very busy for us once again. So, you know, that's my point. 2019 is not going to be a vacation. There's a lot that needs to be done. And, you know, I think really it's about putting research participants uh, at, at the heart of all of this, right? We need to do more as an industry to protect their experience. And uh, for those who follow Innovate MR and follow me specifically across the conference circuit, you know that the research participant experience is something that I hold personally very near and dear to my heart. I spent a lot of time thinking about as a sample provider, how can we improve that experience when in most cases we don't dictate the survey design. Uh, but we can certainly control what's happening before the respondent gets into the survey and certainly what happens to them after they get redirected back to us. So we've been campaigning very hard for the last couple of years and working really closely with a wonderful non-for-profit organization known as the GRBN, the Global Research Business Network. And these are these folks are really an association for all the different associations within our industry. And I would encourage folks in our audience, if you haven't uh, gotten involved with the GRBN, um, certainly reach out to their chair and, and director, Andrew Cannon. He's doing wonderful work and we've been very involved in a lot of research on research initiatives around improving the respondent experience as well as gauging consumer trust. And so the data that you're looking at here was a study that we conducted late last year, uh, the GRBN Trust Survey. It's been a survey that we've run um, several times through the years. We really wanted to understand how do participants in market research perceive market research as an industry versus other verticals, other industries. And so we asked them this question, you know, different people trust different types of organizations and professionals to differing degrees. Overall, to what extent do you personally trust? And we asked them across these different, these different groups or entities. And what's, what's really kind of startling here is the the level of trust within the market research space is pretty low at only 27 percent and so while we think we sort of subscribe to a whole different ethos and code of ethics and that you know we are an exception to the rule and we are exempt from some of these regulations like the do not call list from years back from a consumer standpoint and a consumer perspective we very much are not different or special in fact Internet search engines scored higher scores, uh, a higher score um, at 35% than we did at 27%. Um, and so we're really kind of being grouped together, even though we may be doing more from a privacy and data management perspective than some of these other verticals. Uh, you know, from a consumer standpoint, we aren't that we aren't that different at all. So let's talk a little bit about how all of this is being framed. To think about it from a consumer standpoint, 
this last year in 2018, the number of breaches actually went down, but the amount of data being exposed went up by 126%. So fewer breaches in number, but the level of damage has actually increased substantially. Uh, it was a really busy year. And I think the other notable piece here is that the media really bit down <clears throat> and really socialized these various breaches, the fines and settlements associated with them, and the real gravity and impact that these breaches had on the consumer experience. Everyone listening in, I'm sure, is very well versed on the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal that hit our space last year, 87 million users were impacted. And most recently, the FTC came down with a $5 billion fine on Facebook, which is just incredible. And Stuart and I were chatting yesterday, um, Equifax came out uh, with a massive breach as well, and they've just settled for around $700 million. So it's been a really, really busy year. And you can see here, Facebook had several different privacy breaches, one where the access tokens were made visible and exposed that impacted 20, 29 million users. Uber had a breach, Google had a breach, uh, Marriott had a massive breach of 500 million users. Adhar, Adhar which is an India-based database, exposed 1.1 billion users. So it's really the largest in recorded history. There's also been a very significant uptick in malware as well as ransomware. And I think the big takeaway from all the research that I've been doing as it relates to privacy breaches is that it's really no longer limited to larger enterprises, that small and medium-sized companies are at risk and are a target as well. So let's continue to talk about what is impacting that consumer experience and why they may feel reluctant and reticent to share the personally identifiable information that we often are collecting in our surveys. Cyber fraud uh, will cost $6 trillion by 2021, uh, according to Forbes. And what's really interesting is I've been following this data point through Forbes for uh, a year or two. And last year, Forbes came out uh, with an estimation of only 2 trillion by 2019, but they've upgraded that to 6 trillion by 2021. So the risks are very high. The stakes are high. Consumer trust is low. And at the same time, we're in this pressure cooker because government agencies and regulators are coming down with very stringent laws. And we're gonna talk about some of the things that we're seeing here in the US frame up some of the things we experienced with GDPR. In fact, Stuart and I were just literally chatting about some legislation that's likely to come, come out of New York State, my home state, where I'm based. Um, it's even going to be potentially more aggressive than the California law. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think, you know, something to be said here, you know, the wild west of data is over. You know, if we go back several years, it seemed like there was tons of PII flying around between companies. Um, the, the, the insatiable appetite existed and there was very little legislation coming out. Of course, we had the UK, or sorry, the EU cookie directive that the UK bit down on and passed their directive where we had to be more forthright with um, cookie usage and the types of cookies uh, that were being used. But other than that, it was pretty quiet for several years. And I think a lot of companies exploited that. And I'm here to tell you as a steward that those days are well over. So next up, we're gonna talk about GDPR, present some of that initial framework up till now. It's really been the largest regulatory uh, statute that's come out that's impacted our industry as well as other industries. We're gonna talk about what's happening in China, uh, what they've been up to the last couple of years around their cybersecurity law. Vermont came out with the data broker law last year. I want to make sure everyone in our audience is aware of that. And then we'll get into the CCPA, which I think really is the, the, the line share of what we're doing here today. We want to talk about how to get ready for, for that uh, particular uh, law and, and what you can do is mitigate those risks and, uh, and talk a little bit more about the type of financial and legal exposure those those present. So I'll pass it over to, to Stuart, who's going to give us some background 
on the GDPR and, and what it's all about and how it impacted us as an industry. So take it away, Stuart. So yeah, the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR uh, came into effect the end of May 2018 and there was a massive flurry of activity uh, in advance of that regulation um, by companies to put the proper agreements in place, the data protection agreements, determining whether you're a controller or a processor. And certainly in the aftermath, uh, there was quite a lot of activity uh, to try to get up to uh, compliance levels. It is uh, still, I think, the most far-reaching law of data protection and privacy in the world. Um, and there are quite significant penalties associated with it, as high as potentially 4% of a firm's annual uh, revenue. So certainly for a Google or a Facebook, those numbers would get into the billions of dollars pretty quickly. Um, since the adoption of the regulation, there has been uh, actually a fair bit of enforcement activity by the regulators. Uh, but in terms of actual financial penalties, uh, the uh, issue is really not been as significant. The vast majority of penalties uh, have been associated actually with one company, and that's and that's Google. 50 million of the 56 million euros in penalties that have been assessed to date have been with Google, and it's also been skewed on a country-specific basis. Germany has a lot of claims, but not that many uh, aggregate money damages. France captures the lion's share, at least to date. I think it's something that we need to be mindful of, certainly for any uh, company that has data subjects in Europe that is what is fundamentally going to be captured by this uh, and is being captured by this regulation. It's informed a lot of other regulations, including some slide we'll see on actually in the next slide or thereafter on China, and then much later on in this presentation with respect to the California law or the CCPA. So I don't know if you have Thanks, any Stuart. Uh, one thing yeah. I, yeah, one thing I wanted to, to mention there, Stuart, um, is this, when we were going through GPR compliance last year, we, we really got hit with a flurry of different agreements leading up to uh, May 25th, uh, 2018. And uh, what, what it dawned on me as we were going through a lot of those agreements from vendors, partners, clients, you name it, was there seemed to be some confusion among companies on when they were a controller and when they were a processor. Um, and I think I think that it was a particular challenge for for our industry. I don't know if you want to speak further on that or maybe expand a little bit um, on the key takeaways around that concept. Well, basically, if you're a uh, controller, you have that direct relationship with the with the data subject. Um, and if you're a processor, you're really more of a traditional vendor type of uh, relationship. I think what we find though is, depending on you know the specific sample sources and where they come from it could sometimes be both uh, so it's really uh, difficult to say there's a hard and fast clear-cut rule but the basic concept is you know if you're the controller you're the one who has that uh, relationship if you're the processor you're obviously the one that's going to be processing but what we see with sort of data matching and some of the more exotic uh, methods by which we share data with each other it is something that is 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 something that that is is absolutely not uh, easy to categorize. Right. It really changes from business transaction or business partnership to business partnership. It's not that you sit within the ecosystem and you're always going to be a controller or you're always going to be a processor. It typically varies based on the actual arrangement between you and the third party that you're interacting with. And I think the other piece before we move on to the next slide is the right to eraser. It, it really, to me, presented a new challenge for us, this idea that you would delete a record entirely from your database. Um, you know, I think as an industry, I often joke about this, but it's really true that we're just sort of data hoarders, right? We keep all the data that we have, we like to store it and use it for future reporting. Uh, you know, it's it's really the notion that we would wipe clean our database from 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 you know for for entirety, like never to 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 know about that record. We you know historically would just take a record that had been subscribed, and if they requested to be um, unsubscribed, we would just literally change their status in our database. But all of their information would still be stored, of course, in our secured um, servers. But nowadays, mm -hmm. with with GDPR, when a person requests to be unsubscribed, we entirely delete that record, and, and it's a big change for us, I think, as an industry. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, agreed. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on to the China cybersecurity law. I think a lot of people in our industry aren't quite uh, well versed on on what this law is and how it impacts them. Yeah. So the law in China is is again kind of like Europe. I mean, Europe, as I said, has the most far reaching data protection law and privacy law now with the GDPR, and that has been kind of the standard that's been established for uh, other jurisdictions. Invariably, though. Uh, these laws are not just necessarily what's written in the books, but also is a reflection of sort of the socioeconomic and political environments in which they arose. So in the case of Europe, I mean, it's more kind of social democratic, uh, less kind of freewheeling capitalism, uh, much more prominent role of regulators than, say, private litigants and uh, the plaintiff's bar. Uh, when compared to the U.S., China, of course, is a whole nother category. I mean, it's a it's a communist country uh, still. Uh, the party controls uh, a lot, the military, People's Liberation Army. So it's with that orientation that we look at a lot of these and necessarily have to look at a lot of these issues. I think the big takeaway for China, uh, Lisa, is that, you know, the consents have to be knowing and voluntary. That certainly is a sacrosanct principle under the GDPR. Um, I think the big issue with China is that we see some, and also actually with GDPR, but something that the Chinese seem particularly focused on is this notion that that the consents would be, you know, bundled all into one sort of big package, depending on, you know, very allowing varying uses. And I think they're more focused on, no, no, each individual desired use has to be subject to a known and informed consent. And I think that's something that you should absolutely stay focused on. I think as a practical uh, matter, you know, if you're not that active in China, uh, I think you probably just realistically just, you know, try to follow the law, obviously, but do the best you can. I think if you have any sort of significant operations there, certainly if you have any physical presence um, there, I would say, frankly, uh, you need to get uh, some good legal advice from counsel in China, people who are actually Chinese attorneys. Well said. Okay, let's move on to the Vermont data broker law. Okay, so this is one that's kind of maybe a little bit beneath the radar. Uh, you know, Vermont is a small state. Uh, this just became live uh, this year on Jan 1, and it applies specifically to data brokers. And, you know, threshold question is, you know, what is a data broker? Um, if you're, say, a Lowe's or a Home Depot, and you are selling you know, or licensing your um, customer lists, uh, for purposes to third parties, for purposes of marketing or sale, by those third parties, you're actually not considered a data broker. So our so the so the de so the definition ostensibly is kind of narrow. Um, our traditional notion of what constitutes a data broker, you know, an axiom obviously uh, <laughs> certainly falls in that firms like that uh, are covered by it. I actually looked at the list um, in advance of this of this webinar on the on the Vermont uh, Secretary of State website, where you actually are obligated to register, self-register, and pay a you know nominal fee. Uh, there are only I think less than 150 businesses that have actually self-registered as data brokers. So it's a reporting uh, law, and I think you know the consequences of failure to adhere are probably not so vast, but I think. Depending on your business, I think if you're more of a traditional market research company, uh, you're not going to be a data broker. Uh, if, if you're the one processing the information, you're not going to be a data broker. I think it's conceivable some of the panel companies might fall within that, though there are some exceptions that they enumerate for you know people who register and, and the like. I think this is more around, or the, the rationale of the law seems to be more around people who don't really understand what has happened with their data. In other words, you know, this notion of we have control over our personal information, uh, wh where where is it going and, and, and who's controlling it? This is, I think, a lot of the reasons for this law. But nevertheless, I think if you're a panel company, it's probably a good idea to at least, uh, you know, consider it. Well said, Stuart. I think some of the other things that we got from our review of the Vermont data broker law is that really brokers are required to disclose if a purchaser credentialing process exists, the number and nature of security breaches the brokers experienced in the last 12 months. Um, it's also required that the entire data flow infrastructure be documented and of course, um, specifics around 
the brokering of data of, of PII around uh, around miners. So there's some some key pieces there that I think uh, it's important for our audience to be mindful of. But let's get right into what folks uh, what folks came to our webinar for uh, the big CCPA, the, the California Consumer Privacy Act. This was actually passed last year. A lot of people don't realize that um, it is going live on January 1st, 2020. So I imagine come November or December uh, later this year, it's gonna feel very similar to April or May of last year when we were working on GDPR and agreements were flying back and forth. I mean, I hope that's not the case for our industry, but if I had to look into my crystal ball, I think that will be the case. Um, I think it's important to note here that um, the CCPA definitely adopts several of GDPR's concepts around notice, consent, and, and deletion of data. But for, from our perspective and all the countless conversations that you and I have had, Stuart, around the CCPA, is there's a much broader definition of PII here. Um, really, they see it as information that identifies, relates to, describes, is capable of being associated with, or could reasonably be linked directly or indirectly with a particular consumer or household. So definitely very, very broad. I think the addition of the term household adds a dimension to this privacy law that presents some added complexity. Um, you know, certainly um, that's something to to take into account. But if you could, at a, at a high level, Stuart, just sort of speak to, you know, your perspective of what the CCPA means for our industry, I think that would be really an important thing to share here. Yeah, well, it is absolutely in the U.S. the most far-reaching law we've we've ever contemplated uh, by a very wide margin. So it takes effect next year on January 1. There's regulations that are being uh, created by the state attorney general in California. Those regulations uh, are uh, still in the process of being produced. We're hoping they'll be delivered at the end of the summer into the fall. Those are going to inform how we interpret uh, what a lot of this law is about. But the significance of the law is that it puts a lot of teeth into potential violations where that teeth maybe didn't exist before. Um, originally, this was going to be in California a proposition, meaning a, a ballot initiative that was put to the voters, much like other famous propositions, uh, Proposition 13, Proposition 8, and others, where you have direct democracy. And that was actually considered to be a very terrifying notion for uh, industry. So industry in California got involved with the state legislature to kind of block that proposition to get on the ballot, and they created the CCPA instead, which is a more slightly watered down version. Still pretty uh, extensive. And I think the biggest element is that it has what are known as statutory damages and a private right of action for data breaches. So statutory damages, I think, are significant because the plaintiff party bringing the lawsuit does not have to prove actual damages if all they need to do is demonstrate that there's liability. So the statutory damage specified here is $100 to $750 per data breach record, which may not sound like a lot on its face, but when you multiply that over many thousands or hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, it gets into very, very surreal numbers pretty fast. So the exposure there is going to be clear uh, in the case of data breaches. All other components of the statute, however, are going to be regulated by the attorney general. So there's requirements to get uh, not only consents, much in the way we do with GDPR, that they be knowing and voluntary, you know, not this bundling issue that we talk with regard to China. So we see some commonalities across these different laws. Um, but there are, I'd say, extensive disclosure requirements, um, specifically uh, in the privacy policy. So we're all going to have to uh, identify sources of data, how they're being used, who they're being shared with. We're doing that hopefully to some degree already in our privacy policies, but it's going to be more extensive here. And it'll be a recurring obligation to continually report what's gone on the past 12 months. So you're going to be required to continually update your disclosures through your privacy policy. So that's going to be one major step required is modifying privacy policies. But to do that, you're going to need to do these assessments. And much in the way you did your GDPR assessment, it's not the same thing as GDPR, but it's similar in certain ways. You will need to go through that exercise. If you've done it for GDPR already, great. It'll use, we'll use that to build what we're doing for the CCPA, but it's a similar exercise. You would also mention, mention Lisa, the erasure right under GDPR, that same erasure right exists 
now under the CCPA. So there is a notion of a right, also known as a right to be forgotten. If you want to be removed, uh, you you must be removed and actually you know erased. There's a much broader definition, as the slide shows, of PII. Um, it, it includes, you know, we'd always ask, well, is an IP address uh, PII? And we'd say, well, in the U.S., probably not, but in Europe, uh, yes. Here it is. The IP addresses are specifically identified as PII, so that falls within it. That's not a way to get around the statute is by limiting it to IP addresses. IP addresses are PII for purposes of this law. You fall within it if that's all that you're collecting or you remove everything else. Um, it's defining a household, not any particular individual. So, you know, you might have just a, a household, uh, as many families do, a household uh, you know, device or devices that you would be using, and, and, and those would all be considered, um, you know, definition of your of your identifiable information. That's great. Thanks so much, Stuart. It's really helpful information. I mean, I think it should be noted that a company doesn't need to be physically located in California for the law to apply, right? Just generating sales in the state, interacting with um, consumers that are, are residents of California is, is really the only requirement. We'll get into a bit more of, of the detail in, in future slides here. Um, but it, the CCPA really applies to information in any format. So it's not solely restricted to online practice, which I think is also something really important to mention. And, you know, I think a lot of folks listening in today, um, some of which uh, are really in U.S.-centric businesses based in the U.S., interacting solely with U.S. consumers, other U.S. constituents. And so when GDPR hit last year, a lot of those businesses didn't really um, have to interact too much with that regulation and, and make a lot of change. And I think Fast forward into 2019, 2020, um, the CCPA is really forcing our hand as, as, as businesses operating here in the U.S. Um, really needing to make some, some substantial changes and certainly making sure that we're not treating what we did as GDPR as full coverage. Um, they are very different, similar, but are different in, in several ways. And so I think it's important to, to take note of that. Yep, agreed. And as a panel uh, company, we want to be mindful of how many times we update our privacy policy because, you know, again, the days where you just would send a notification passively, let people know that there was a change, those days are over. It's about getting an active opt-in and agreement and knowing what to do with those that don't actually actively opt in, you know, uh, because they really haven't complied with the most recent privacy policy. And so it has very real financial implications for, for our business and other businesses. So, you know, every single update, we want to be really careful and cognizant about that, that we're not kind of being redundant or, you know, presenting too many changes across too many instances to where it, it, it will have a negative impact on the business. And I'd also add that it is relating to definitions of personal data um, on the context of, you know, historically it's been a, a name associated with an address. A lot of the data breach statutes require more like a, an account number or social security, that sort of thing. Here under the CCPA, things like we would always ask in the U.S., you know, is an IP address personally identifiable information? And usually the answer was it is in Europe, but not in the U.S., so we're okay. That's no longer the case. The, the, the CCPA expressly identifies IP addresses as personal information. So you need to go broad. You need to go deep. You have to assume that the CCPA is the adoption of a European-style approach to personal information with some important twists, okay? But, but it's that same orientation. It's right. very broad. It sure is. And let's talk about the, the three basic requirements for CCPA to apply. And I think, again, pretty broad here, covers most of us in the industry. Business must generate annual gross revenue in excess of $25 million or, and keep in mind there's the or condition here, the business must receive or share personal information of more than 50,000 California residents annually, or the business must derive at least 50% of its annual revenue by selling the personal information of California residents. So again, I feel like this covers a lot of us in our industry, and it's certainly something that's important to know. Yeah, if, if, if I could add one thing, um, you know, there's a misperception when people look at this, they say, well, this doesn't apply to me uh, because I'm not selling any information and my revenues aren't at 25 million. The definition of sell under this law is, again, assume the most broad definition possible. It is includes sharing or transferring. So you don't have to, strictly speaking, sell the information. You just have to share it. 
Mm -hmm. And that's very important point to make Stuart, because I think obviously there's instances where we're not selling it, but we are sharing information, whether it's passing demographics so that we can keep the survey experience shorter for respondents. I mean, that's in itself a very uh, benevolent thing to do. Uh, and we're trying to create a better experience for respondents, but just the idea of sharing demographic info related to a specific record um, you know, and information around them, uh, also for data validation. So things like IP address uh, required for digital fingerprinting or PII associated with, you know, U.S. Postal Service address validation. I mean, all of those things, you know, aren't being done with the, the kind of idea that we're going to sell and, and, and monetize. It's, it's more to create a better experience for respondents or to further validate them, but they, of course, all fall under that same umbrella. So, um, no one gets out unscathed. Uh, everyone, everyone's covered here. Uh, so I think the big takeaway, right, is the increased disclosure is really a central tenet of the CCPA. It really requires, you know, exceptional, exceptional levels of transparency. You know, consumer rights and use of data have to be disclosed. There's various categories of PII that may be shared or sold to third parties. Um, and all of those different categories need to be outlined. And I think we first felt that initially back when we worked on the EU cookie directive all those years ago, Stuart, where you said to me, Lisa, we need to lay out the different types of categories of cookies that are being used. And I thought to myself, what, are you kidding me? Like, that's so much. Like, there's so many different things that we're doing around cookie management. And to lay out every single type of category seemed really in a kind of overly abundant and, and transparency, but fast forward all these years later, the level of transparency and the categorization of PII and data sharing and segmentation and classification, it's really like next level. Um, and of course, like we see in some of these other um, laws, disclosures have to be updated every 12 months. So, you know, I think this goes to point like we can't predict the future. And I always ask you, Stuart, it makes you uncomfortable. I don't know if it's your lawyer brain. I ask you, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And you are a very uh, person of absolutes and black and black and white. Um, but, you know, I want to do our best to try to forecast some of these trends on the horizon. And, and I think the first one that really stands out for me is this is a huge caution light for tech companies, large and small. And, you know, consumers are really learning the value of their data. I was just reading an article not too long ago um, where the author was experimenting with the idea or the notion of monetizing his data. And so he, he went out to different companies um, and participated in different offers. And he couldn't believe, just as a normal consumer, the level of data that was being shared right down to his geolocation. And, and one app that he had signed on for was tracking every single movement he made. And we all know that this happens. There's a ton of passive metering that's going on in our industry. There's tons of um, kind of billboard exposures and using through geolocation and mobile apps. So, you know, I think given all of that, consumers are really starting to understand that their data has value and it should be really interesting to see how that takes shape moving forward. Um, you know, as we saw earlier in the presentation, winning back consumer trust is not going to be easy. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, and and it really, companies are going to need to be more transparent. That is something that is abundantly clear to me. And legislation on the federal level is likely. And of course, more states and countries are going to follow. I was just reading about New York State. I mentioned this earlier in the presentation. The, the bill that's looking to be passed this summer is going to be even more aggressive than that of the CCPA. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I think we need something at the federal level. And maybe, Stuart, that's a great time for you to interject around your work with Privacy for America and just explain to the audience what this coalition is and how it's really um, advocating for our industry and other, other industries alike. Yeah, so the Privacy for America is a coalition of uh, industry participants who want to create federal legislation uh, relating to privacy. And the stimulus behind it is all of these laws we've been talking about, is that if you're a company of any size, but particularly a small or medium-sized company, how on earth do you spend the time, the effort, the brain energy, the, 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 the financial resources to comply with all this. It's really, really tough. So the idea is, why not be like 
the EU, why not be more like Canada, where you have federal legislation that kind of governs privacy? So the Insights Association uh, has has done a, I think, very admirable and important work in participating in this coalition and opting to participate in this coalition so the market research and data analytics industry can have a seat at the table. So we're at a point now, and I'm working with a smaller working group through Insights Association and for the Insights Association to craft this legislation. And we're just looking out as best we can for the interests of our industry. I think as Lisa had said very early on in this discussion, the notion that we're gonna have an exemption uh, from any privacy laws for market research and data analytics, that may have been possible 25 years ago. Uh, that ain't gonna happen now. Uh, we have some residual benefit under the TCPA, under the do not call and a few other places, but generally speaking, and I think that the, that the earlier slide Lisa showed with regard to public perception uh, is very much in accord and alignment with how regulators perceive our industry to the extent they even understand it. Um, they do not view our industry as some, you know, white hat, uh, you know, important uh, function. I think they, they very much view us uh, suspiciously as people who are uh, getting all sorts of data from different sources and not really uh, being fully transparent about what we're doing. I'm not saying that's what's going on, but I'm saying that's the perception. And I think that we, it's our job to break through that perception to be sure, but I think to a large degree, this is the environment we're in and it's not going to change. So we're trying the best we can through this coalition to impact any future legislation. It's not a foregone conclusion this legislation will come to fore. All this coalition is doing is putting together a draft bill that will be submitted to Congress to hopefully push through. Uh, the expectation is that's going to happen very soon, like in the next few months. So, you know, will that happen before the next election in 2020? I have no idea. I'm not a Washington uh, insider, but I think there's clearly a lot going on even right now as we speak with uh, the Mueller investigation and all the rest. So, you know, will there be adequate appetite for this? Uh, who knows, but I think there's great demand or some federal legislation which will supersede and override all these other state laws. Yeah, I look forward to that, quite honestly. I think, you know, this idea that specific states are putting out different bills, I, you know, as a, as a business leader, it's, it's really hard to keep up with that. Um, and it has a really significant impact on business and on our focus and what we're working on. Um, so I'd, I'd love to see something at the federal level you know, and I think it just sort of speaks to there's there's a trend against big tech, you know, based on some of the stuff we've been talking about, Stuart, with that recent congressional hearing that you you listened in on. Uh, there's a real demand coming from from both Congress as well as the general consumer population. And so hopefully, you know, we will see something at the federal level soon. But with with the election coming up uh, here in in, uh, in the near term, I, I think people and politics are going to be focused on some other big items. Uh, on their uh, specific agenda, so time will tell. And and so I wanted to kind of close this up before we get to to questions. And and luckily we have some time for questions. This was actually a quote. I won't read the whole thing, but it's a quote that you provided to me uh, on a blog that I wrote for Women in Research, uh, because this is a topic that I feel like a lot of us in the industry just don't have a good sense on. You know, we're not lawyers by trade. That's that's your role. Thank God for that. Uh, but one thing you said to me was, you know, and I first came to you when I had heard about the CCPA, I thought, well, we're, we're good to go, right? Because we, we went through GDPR, we went through that, that, that incredible battle last, last May and, and got all of our ducks in a row and spent months and months preparing prior to that. Um, and you had said something that that doesn't really ensure that you, you are compliant for CCPA. And certainly it presents that notion that you, there's some readiness there, right? Uh, you've done some, some legwork uh, but maybe you can speak to that a little bit, Stuart, as we close up here, just for a minute or two on, you know, GDPR readiness for sure, but there are definitely some very specific differences that come with CCPA that our audience should be mindful of. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's true. And, and I think, as you said, I mean, GDPR and, and CCPA definitely have some, some commonalities. I mean, the CCPA is the most far reaching 
privacy law and it adopts many of the components, uh, particularly around consent-based notions of participation that the GDPR has, has had. But there are differences, and I'll identify a couple of those in a moment. But you know, high level, uh, if you've done the GDPR exercise, uh, that will absolutely help you uh, significantly. It gives you a massive head start because you're going to be doing a lot of the same things of taking an inventory of what data you get, what personal information you collect, um, what you do with it once you get it, and um, particularly who you share it with, and then how long you keep it for, uh, and what your purpose of use is. All of those things will be very helpful, basically a data flow chart. But in terms of some of the fundamental differences, I think there's, you know, interestingly, at least interesting for me, uh, is there's, there's, there's a lot more requirement uh, under the CCPA in terms of disclosure of the personal information that you're, quote, selling, which basically here means sharing or disclosing. So you'll need to disclose this in the privacy policies. So you don't really probably do that in most cases now. You have to describe, for example, the categories of personal information you're collecting, the categories of personal information that you're sharing with third parties, and then the categories of inf personal information disclosed about consumers and for what business purpose. So all of this, it has to be for the prior 12-month period. So you're going to have to uh, put all this in your privacy policy. It's got to be accurate. It's got to be for the prior 12 months. And you've got to be in a position to stay current and keep it updated. Because, in, again, any misstatement, I mean, people sometimes think, Privacy policies, well, I'll just look at what my competitor is doing and I'll, you know, change a few words around. That is a recipe for disaster. And I don't think I'm being an alarmist when I say that, because when you do something like that, you're making a promise. OK, think of a privacy policy as a promise or a contract that you're creating with potentially the entire planet. Anybody who looks at that privacy policy, you're creating a contract with them. If what you say in that contract either fails to include something that's really, really important, what we call an omission, or it says something that's untrue or misleading. That's a separate problem, but a related one. So in either of those cases, you've got to be very clear that you're accurate, clear, and transparent. So you got to get that right. So a big part of this deal here with CCPA is taking that inventory, understanding all those data flows, and then having a clear, transparent representation in the privacy policy and making sure it's current. That's number one. And this is, you know, something which you can thank the California legislature, state legislature for. There is going to be a boatload of obligations with all of the parties you're getting the information from and sharing the information with. Just remember the entire process under GDPR with the DPAs, the processor agreements, the controller agreements. It's a similar sort of deal here, but it's more than just changing the names of the words of the contracts around. It's getting the language in the agreements because here there is an erasure right, meaning someone, as Lisa said much earlier on in the presentation, if someone wants their name removed, you not only have to remove them from your database, you have to contact all of your service providers and this is where it gets preposterous. I mean, if it's like, say it's on AWS, you know, you, you contact AWS and say, you know, re remove, you know, Joe Gonzalez from our list because Mr. Gonzalez requested to be removed. I mean, this is the level of requirement. All service providers have to comply. Um, so these are the challenges we're going to be facing. But I'd say those are two fundamental considerations. Privacy policy, make sure it's clear, make sure it's accurate based on all your data flow analysis. And then secondarily, you're going to need to have good agreements with everyone who's going to touch this data, and you're going to be required to erase or delete information once the respondent requests or the, 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 the individual requests their personal data be deleted. One of the other things, too, that Stuart, you and I have chatted about is the statutory damages and private right of action and how that's different you know, with something like the CCPA versus GDPR. Do you want to touch on that a little bit and explain the difference between those those concepts from GDPR versus CCPA? Certainly. Certainly. So again, it applies at a high level to my view of just a very different political and economic and social system. 
you know, the U.S. Uh, is, at least from a litigation perspective, the Wild West. So you've got private rights of action. You've got some, in theory, rights of action in Europe too, but the reality is it's all about the regulators. Here in California, what they've done is the Attorney General is responsible, as I said, for administering, or not administering, of enforcing this law. Um, however, there is a additional element to that that gives individuals and the plaintiff's bar, the class action attorneys, the ability to bring a lawsuit in the event of a data breach. And there's something called statutory damages. Statutory damages, for those of you that do telephone work, you'll be very familiar under the TCPA. Certain laws, certain statutes have statutory damages. In a normal situation, in 95% of all laws or 99% of all laws, you have to not only prove liability, meaning in this case, say there's a data breach, but you also have to then show, okay, what are the damages? How do I prove people were harmed? That's a separate inquiry. That's a separate level of proof and investigation. With statutory damages, you eliminate that second step. You just say, is there liability or is there not liability? If so, you apply the statutory damage. And that's where it gets very horrific because if you're, a, if not horrific, if you're a plaintiff, you actually love it because you're then able to just compute in a simple mathematical formula. How many data breaches were there? Multiply it by the statutory damage. Under this particular statute, CCPA, it's $100 to $750 per violation. That may not sound like a lot, but if you're talking about tens of thousands or dare I say hundreds of thousands or even millions of records, you can do the math just as better, better than me. It adds up to tens, hundreds of millions, maybe even billions. So it's quite horrific from that perspective. There's also the notion of the uh, damage range by the attorney general. If the attorney general just brings an action for failure to comply, say, because your privacy policy said something that was untrue, uh, it's a range of 2,500 to 7,500. Not clear how that's actually going to be enforced. Is it going to be based on the number of people impacted? Will it be on the per instance? That's something that maybe the regulations will inform us better about. But the point is, statutory damages give the uh, balance of power to the plaintiffs, to the to the plaintiffs bar, to the class action people who are bringing the lawsuits because they don't have to prove actual damages. Thanks for that, Stuart. I love your passion, and hopefully we haven't uh, scared people too much. I, I imagine some of you might be might be in the corner in the fetal position with fear in your eyes. But uh, you know, I think the key here and and really the impetus for this webinar is so that we're all prepared and move into January 1st, 2020 with a feeling of peace and calm because we've done we've done our due diligence and, and we're really ready to ready to go. Um, so with that, I will throw it back to, to Brittany and see if we have any questions as we wrap up the webinar. Yep, we do have a couple. The first one comes from Dan. Any specific insight, concerns, or legislation regarding researching younger persons participants, uh, for example, teens, students, and young adults. There's a lot to unpack. Right. Do you want to, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, well, there's existing legislation already at the national level, COPA, um, and that's relates to, uh, children under the age of 13. So 12 and under, and, um, you know, there you need parental consent to collect any information. Um, you know, in this privacy legislation that we're considering now through uh, Privacy for America, the coalition I mentioned that the Insights Association has a seat at the table at, it's participating in this coalition with the idea of help, hopefully having an impact on the future privacy laws in the United States. Great work the association's doing. Um, there is certainly a lot of interest in uh, the children's uh, side of things, because uh, you know some of the companies participating uh, are in that space. Uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, so yeah, stay tuned. But it's a hot button issue for all the obvious reasons. Uh, but right now, you know, the big ticket item is is COPA in the EU. Um, the standard set there is age 16. Um, there are some differences based on the member countries' uh, laws. There are some that, that set a higher threshold than 16, but 16 is thought to be the um, overall benchmark. 
That's great. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, I think um, we've long subscribed to, to COPA regulation and making sure that we're engaging with teens the right way. Uh, and certainly if, you know, minors 12 and under uh, going through through parental consent. But it's surprising. I still see requests, bid opportunities that come our way that are collecting or seeking to collect PII from minors. And of course, we always turn those down. But uh, I still think this is an area of law that a lot of uh, industry practitioners don't have a good handle on. So thank you for that commentary. Britt, what was the next question as we wrap up here? Yep, this one's a little long, so bear with me here, but it is from Heather. Uh, this may be too soon, but in terms of facial recognition and machine learning advances and how they relate to biometric research, online focus groups, or in-person interview visual recordings, are there elements of the new legislation that are being crafted that will tackle the recommendations or requirements for protocol and protection of that visual information? She's had several requests for collections of this kind of information. Mm -hmm. It's a lot, I know. <laughs> yeah, Stuart, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, we do, we've, we've had requests come in on our side for webcam interviewing, you know, sharing of, of uh, you know, pictures, respondent pictures, uh, uploading, you know, pictures of their home. Um, but certainly facial recognition is something that's that's uh, not a relatively new tech, but it, it's starting to pick up speed um, and, and be applied in, in kind of real world research uh, methodology. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, uh, it's certainly a very topical and important question. So thank you for raising it, Heather. I mean, look, uh, Biometric is clearly uh, covered under the GDPR. It's covered under the CCPA. Uh, there are some states that got way out in front of this, like Illinois, <clears throat> which already has a bi you know statute on the books about biometric uh, data. Um, you know, it's going to be more sensitive uh, data in all likelihood in most cases. That is, you'll even have not just it covered by these laws, but you'll have maybe additional. Uh, requirements uh, that go above and beyond the baseline requirements. Um, so biometric data, it's, 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 it's obviously a very valuable and important research tool, or at least it can be, um, expected to be regulated accordingly. And it already is, but expected to, to be even more so. Great, thank you guys. Uh, we had a couple more questions come in from uh, Tim and Nancy, but we have reached the top of the hour. So any of those questions that we didn't get to, we can follow up with you guys uh, directly afterwards. And also as a reminder, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar to all attendees in the coming days. So look out for that. And lastly, a huge thank you to Lisa and Stuart for taking time out of your day to help us all have a better understanding of this and to make sure that we're all prepared for these different privacy legislations. Thank you, Britt. Thank you, Stuart. Have a wonderful day, everyone.